Today, I'm gonna to show you how to make candy cane vodka using a few simple ingredients. First of all, sweet potatoes. Second of all, candy canes. We're also gonna use a little bit of malted barley and some distiller's active yeast. Without further ado, let's get this thing going. Making vodka is the coolest thing I've done in a long time. If you're new to this hobby, you'll definitely want to watch this video. When it comes to distilling, there are differing opinions on almost every aspect of the process. This video will give you a great understanding of the process so you can begin to do your own research. Anyway, I learned a lot of cool things over the past two weeks, which I'm excited to share with you. While I begin to prepare my mash pot, let me give you a quick rundown of what to expect in this video. We'll talk about what you're gonna need. We're gonna talk about making the mash, fermenting the mash, clarifying and filtering the wash, preparing the still, the distillation process and collection, the benefits of vodka in general, and then we'll do a summary of mistakes to avoid. So, as I go along, I'm gonna point out all the mistakes I made in an effort to prevent you from making those same mistakes. All right, let's talk about what you're gonna need. There are some very specific items you're gonna to need to complete this process. Instead of boring you with all those details right now, I'll simply list them in the description of this video along with the links to where you can purchase them. Now, let's get back to preparing our mash. When it comes to making our mash, our goal is to use enzymes to break the potato starches down into fermentable sugars. To achieve this, we have a few options. Number one, we can simply add an enzyme powder. Number two, we can add barley, which contains the necessary enzymes. If you decide to go this route, you should know that European brewers overwhelmingly prefer the two-row barley. Number three, or we can use sweet potatoes, which already contain the necessary enzymes. That special enzyme is called amylase. You should know, while many people simply boil their potatoes, the slower you cook them, the sweeter they become. This is because the amylase enzymes are most effective at certain temperatures. More about that in a minute. All right, first of all, we wanna add five gallons of water to our mash pot. Then we need to heat that water to between 160 and 165 degrees. Then we need to go through and wash each potato. After that, we need to cut the potatoes. I cut mine into eight pieces, but it wasn't small enough. So I'd recommend cutting each potato into 16 pieces or more. That brings us to mistake number one. I didn't cut the potatoes into small enough pieces. Number five. Once the water has been heated to between 160 and 165 degrees, you can drop the potatoes in. The water temperature will drop about 20 degrees. Number six, now let's bring the temperature up to 149 degrees and hold it there for 40 minutes. This will activate the beta amylase enzyme. Stir it about every 20 minutes. Number seven, then let's bring the water temperature up to 155 degrees and leave it there for two hours. This is gonna activate the alpha amylase enzyme. Again, let's stir it about every 20 minutes. Number eight, at this point, I added eight cups of malted barley and 64 candy canes. Number nine, now let's bring the water temperature up to 170 degrees and leave it there for one hour. This is gonna break down the potato fibers so we can mash them. Now, let's let the mash cool overnight. When you get up in the morning, go ahead and mash the potatoes using your long handled masher. This brings us to mistake number two. My potato masher wasn't long enough, so I actually decided to not mash my potatoes because I figured it would introduce bacteria into the mash. Number 12, let's get a gravity reading using our brewer's hydrometer. These readings are temperature specific, so make sure to read the instructions before using it. 
My goal was to get a reading of about 1.080, which equates to a potential ABV of 10.4%. Unfortunately, my mash was only at 1.030. This equates to a mere 3.9% ABV. The reason for this is because I didn't cut my potatoes into small enough pieces. They were actually still too hard to even try and mash. So I decided to add the rest of my malted barley and cook it for another two hours at 200 degrees and 30 minutes at 210 degrees. I figured the additional barley would help to further break down the potato starches. Also, barley contains natural sugars which I knew would help to boost that gravity reading. You should know that your mash will take a long time to cool down. I set mine outside because we did have a nice winter day going. It was about 35 degrees outside and as you can see it took quite a long time to cool down. I mean we're talking hours. But after it did finally cool down I got a second hydrometer reading. At this point, my mash was at 1.050. This equates to a potential ABV of 6.5%. It's still not great, but at this point, I was ready to move on to the fermentation process. All right, now let's talk about fermenting the mash. The first thing we want to do is create a yeast starter. A starter will do two things for you. Number one, it will allow the yeast to sort of wake up. And number two, it will allow the yeast a good environment for multiplication. The more hungry, healthy, and viable yeast cells you have, the faster fermentation begins and the cleaner the flavors that are produced. So making a yeast starter is really quite simple. The first thing you wanna do is take a glass container and fill it about halfway full with the wash from your mash at a temperature of about 110 degrees. For me, that was two cups of wash. Then, simply add your yeast. For me, I added two tablespoons of distiller's active dry yeast. After that, give it a quick stir until all the yeast has been moistened. It'll look a little something like this. After that, there's not much left to do. Just wait about 20 minutes while the yeast will begin to multiply. This is where you need to make a few decisions. Number one, the first decision is in regards to the mash. Some people remove it before fermentation and some people leave it in during the fermentation process. I chose to leave mine in. Number two, the second decision is in regards to aerating the mash. Adequate oxygen levels in the wash are necessary for the yeast to grow and reproduce. The way you would aerate your wash is by dumping it into your fermentation bucket through a strainer. I would have done this but actually didn't have a second bucket at the time. That brings us to our next mistake that I made, which is I didn't have a second bucket so I couldn't properly aerate my wash. I ended up aerating mine by hand, simply mixing air into the wash with my large spoon. Okay. Once your wash has cooled down to about 90 degrees, you can dump the yeast starter in. At temperatures much higher than this, you risk killing the yeast. You should know it is not good to introduce oxygen once the fermentation process has begun. That's where the airlock comes into play. What does the fermentation airlock do? Well, there are a couple of common models of airlocks, but they use the same principle. The airlock prevents air from entering your fermentation vessel while still allowing the carbon dioxide made during fermentation to escape. If your system didn't have anywhere for this gas to go, the pressure would build up. At some point, the pressure would overcome the strength of your lid and probably explode, making a really messy situation. Once your bacteria and yeast are going to town on these sugars, you should start to see the carbon dioxide bubbles moving through the fermentation airlock. The more active the yeast are, the more bubbles they will make. As the fermentation slows down, the bubbles become less frequent. The bubbles will exit through the airlock in little burps every few minutes or so. When you notice the absence of bubbles entirely, the fermentation is complete. This is where another mistake comes into play. I filled my fermentation bucket too full 
so my airlock actually overflowed. I was able to find a solution for this. Let's watch this short video in case the same thing happens to you. Is your three-piece airlock system overflowing all over the place? Then I've got a solution for you. It happened to me last night and I found a solution for it. My fermentation bucket was too full and therefore the airlock tip was too long. So it began to fill with uh, wart as you can see in the photo right here. And before long, it's starting to bubble all over the place and it even got worse and worse and worse. There's a simple solution. All you need to do is shorten the tip on that airlock. I'll show you exactly what I mean. The problem is that tip is going down all the way into the wart and it's shoving the water out instead of shoving the carbon dioxide out. Boom, cut it right about there and then throw it right back into the top of your fermentation bucket and you'll be operating just as normal. Now let's talk about fermentation temperatures. I made a short video about that as well. Let's watch. So you're getting ready to ferment some alcohol but have no idea what to keep the temperature at. First of all, a steady temperature is ideal for a good fermentation process. A warmer temperature will speed up the process but lower the alcoholic yield. It's important to check your yeast package to know what temperature is necessary and go with those guidelines. That being said, typically the optimum temperature of the fermenting mash is 78 degrees. It should never exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit as it can kill the yeast. Make sure your thermometer is calibrated by dropping it into boiling water and making sure it reads 212 degrees Fahrenheit. For me, the best way to achieve this temperature was to purchase a small space heater and keep the room at about 75 degrees. The reason you want to keep the fermenting liquid in a room that is below that 78 degree benchmark is because the fermentation process actually generates heat. How much the temperature increases depends on how vigorously fermentation is taking place. During the early stages of fermentation, it's common to see a temperature increase of around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So, how will you know when the fermentation is complete? Fermentation will take anywhere from 5 to 10 days. Mine took a total of 7 days. Once your airlock stops bubbling, you're going to want to pull the lid off your fermentation bucket and drop in your brewer's hydrometer. Since the gravity reading of water is 1.000, that's what we're aiming for. So, once your fermentation is complete and your gravity reading is 1.000, then it'll be time to move on to the clarification process. Now, it's time to separate the mash from the wash. This is called the clearing process or clarification process. And the whole point in doing this is that we're going to give that wash a day or two to settle and clear itself. This is important because it reduces the risk of scorching material on the bottom of your kettle during the distillation process. Now, I don't know if there's an exact science to this. I don't know how other people do it. I just kind of manhandled my pot and dumped as much wash into my clearing bucket as I could while still trying to keep the, uh, the mash behind. I'll show you what this looks like here in a second. So as you can see, I got most of it out of there. And then uh, I think letting it settle for one day would be sufficient. I let mine set for two days. And what I have here is uh, a strainer lined with cheesecloth. And the whole point is to just filter out as much sediment as possible. So that when I put this on the burner and begin the distillation process, none of that sediment is going to settle on the bottom and start to burn. So I sped this up on the camera two times, but I did want to exactly show you kind of what it looked like. Now let's talk about cleaning your brand new still. Once you've purchased a new still, your natural tendency will be to start using it immediately. But there are a couple of steps you need to follow first. Any metal manufacturing process leaves a residue of manufacturing oils on the item manufactured. These oils and other residues can negatively impact your distillate and spoil it. 
The following steps will ensure a better result during your first distillation. Step one, wash the still. Take all components of your still apart and wash them with a dishwashing liquid solution. Be liberal with the use of the detergent as it will take off most, if not all, of the residual manufacturing oils. Then, rinse it thoroughly to make sure you leave no soapy residue on or in the still, especially inside the condenser. Step two, steam clean your still by filling it about 50% with water, sealing it up and bringing it to a boil. Let the run continue until you recover about 25% of the water you placed inside the boiler. Step three, vinegar run. Fill your still with 750 milliliters of white spirit vinegar and one half gallon of water for every 1.3 gallons of capacity. Bring the still to a boil and let it run until you have recovered at least one liter of distillate for every 1.3 gallons of capacity. Step four, now let's do a second steam clean by once again filling your still about 50% with water, sealing it up and bringing it to a boil. Let the run continue until you recover about 25% of the water you placed inside the boiler. Finally, step five, let's do a sacrificial run. Your first distillation is always referred to as a sacrificial run as you should not expect unaffected spirits coming out of the still for the first time. This is normally done with a sugar wash because it has a high alcohol percentage and it's cheap and easy to make. Alternatively, a solution of cheap vodka and water can be used. 750 milliliters of vodka with 750 milliliters of water for every 1.3 gallons of boiler capacity. With the sugar wash, distill as you normally would, but do not expect a usable product as there may still be some contamination. With the vodka and water solution, run it until you recover about 40% of the original volume. Finally, your new still is ready to use. So this actually brings us to another mistake. I didn't clean my still good enough, so I actually got both oil residue and black flakes in my distillate. If your still behaves like mine did, you're gonna notice during the cleaning process that you probably have some leaks. For me, the best solution was to use pipe threading tape. There are actually four connections that you're gonna to wanna to tighten up. Two right here on the top of your thumper keg. And I'll show you how I did that. It's quite simple. Just wrap it around a few times with that pipe thread tape. And this actually was a perfect solution. My leaks were gone immediately. All right, and then also on the condenser, there's a connection there. And on the top of the boiler, there's a connection right there. You're gonna to wanna to wrap both of those as well. And then I'll tie it all together and give you a quick overview. So the connection in the condenser, if you use the thumper, then the, those two on the thumper right there. And then on top of the boiler is the fourth one. And that will fix all your leaks. And that is, in my opinion, the best solution. Now let's talk about the distillation process. For any newbie, I think the distillation process will be extremely intimidating. Let me quickly summarize the sections for you. Number one, how does distillation work? Number two, how long does the distillation process take? Number three, how much vodka will it produce? Number four, making the cuts, four shots, heads, hearts, and tails. Number five, what is a thumper keg? Six, cooling temperature for running water through the condenser. And number seven, my results. So how does distillation work? Distillation doesn't actually produce alcohol. It simply concentrates the alcohol that is already present in your wash. When distilling alcohol, it is important to monitor the temperature of vapor being condensed within your still, as this will tell a lot about the product that's coming out of your pot or reflux still. Here are some boiling points of common products contained in your wash. The specific type of alcohol that we seek is called ethyl alcohol. Ethanol is able to be separated from water in a wash because ethanol boils at a lower temperature than water. 
pure ethanol boils at 173 degrees Fahrenheit, while water does not boil until 212 degrees. In a nutshell, wash is heated up in a still to a temperature above 173 degrees, but below 212 degrees. Ethanol starts to boil and turns into a vapor, separating from the wash water. The vapor is then condensed, turned back into a liquid, and drips out of the still into a mason jar or some other collection vessel. The alcohol distillation temperature that the wash will boil at depends entirely upon its ABV, somewhere between the boiling point of ethanol, 173 degrees, and water, 212 degrees, unless you're at a higher elevation. The higher your wash's ABV is, the closer your temperature will be to 173. And the lower your ABV is, the closer your temperature will be to 212. To further complicate things, as you start to boil the ethanol out of your wash, the ABV of the wash will decrease, so the temperature that it boils at will also change. This photo illustrates this exact concept. Check it out. This leads me to why you need to be able to control your heat input. Controlling the rate of vaporization is important for a pot still so that you do not end up pumping vapors through so quickly that the condenser cannot condense it all back to a liquid. When this happens, you end up with vapor blowing out of the end of your still, which is very bad. Basically, you will want to steadily increase the temperature, maintaining a range of 175 to 195 for as long as possible. Turn off the heat when it reaches 212 degrees. When all the elements of your temperature control come together, the condenser coil should release a steady drip of vodka, not a stream, but a quick and regular amount that flows without interruption. You'll want to dial in your heat source setting to achieve a consistent one to three drips per second. Also, you can turn on your condenser when the boiler reaches 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So, how long does the distillation process take? Well, without a thumper, plan on about seven hours to process five gallons of wash. With a thumper, it will actually take longer than that. How much vodka will it produce? Well, the average numbers are about 10 to 20%. For example, Five gallons of wash will produce anywhere from a half gallon to one gallon of vodka. I actually found a really cool resource. Um, I'll put the link in the description of this video. It's actually AmericanHomeDistillers.com. They have a distilling calculator. And I wanted to explain a little bit um, about the whole concept of how much vodka uh, your wash will yield. So as you can see here, According to their calculator, five gallons of wash at a 5% ABV will produce about 36 ounces of alcohol. Now, if you take that same amount of wash and increase the ABV to 10%, actually doubling it, you will actually double the output from 36 ounces to almost 72 ounces. So this is a great resource you're going to want to check out based upon how many gallons of wash you have, and what the uh, ABV is. Um, in my experience, the 85% efficiency is a pretty good number to plug in for that uh, calculator. All right, now let's talk about making the cuts. Four shots, heads, hearts, and tails. They're called phases of distillation. Because the various alcohols and chemical compounds in a wash separate at different boiling points, there are several phases of each distillation run. As we mentioned, four shots, heads, hearts, and tails. During the different phases of a run, an experienced distiller will notice that the taste and smell may vary considerably. Generally, only the hearts portion is kept. The tails are sometimes set aside to be stilled again in the future. So, when are the distillation cuts made? An experienced distiller knows when to make a cut from the heads to the hearts and also from the hearts to the tails. 
In distilling, a cut is when a distiller stops collecting in one jar and starts collecting in a new jar. This is a skill that is learned over time and requires a bit of practice. The four shots. The first approximately 5% of your run will be the four shots. Four shots contain methanol, which is extremely poisonous. Do not consume this part of your run. Take care to isolate your four shots thoroughly and throw them out. Consuming methanol can cause an array of issues, including blindness. Basically, you're going to want to hold the temperature at 168 degrees for about 10 minutes to get rid of the four shots. You can expect for every five gallons of wash, approximately 250 milliliters will be your four shots. Now let's talk about the heads. As the temperature continues to increase, ethanol will boil and you will be distilling real spirits. So the next 20% of your vodka run is known as the heads. Similar to the four shots, the heads are filled with volatile alcohols. One of the staples of the heads is a particularly volatile alcohol known as acetone. Acetone has a distinct solvent-like smell, making its identification pretty easy for anyone with a working nose. It has an unpleasant smell like nail polish or methylated spirits. Drinking your heads won't make you blind, but they will leave you with the worst hangover of your life. Like your four shots, you'll want to isolate these and throw them out. Another method to determine when to cut the heads is by determining the alcohol percentage. This percentage is very high at the start of the distillation process, typically 80% and higher. Now let's talk about the hearts. When the alcohol percentage falls below 80%, it's time to cut to the hearts. The hearts are the best part of the run and contain the most ethanol. It smells sweet and tastes good. The hearts are the liquid you will end up keeping and hopefully drinking. The hearts will make up approximately 50% of your total vodka run. This is where a skillful distiller really shines. By accurately identifying where the acetone stops and the ethanol begins, a distiller maximizes their number of high quality jars of product. You'll notice the solvent smell of acetone taper off and a sweet smelling ethanol come forward. Many professionals and longtime distillers agree that this is the portion of the run from about 190 degrees Fahrenheit to about 200 or 205. Now let's talk about the tails. When the alcohol content has dropped to 50%, we proceed to the final cut. This part of the run is called the tails and will, and will total about 25% of your run. There are several ways that one can tell when the tails begin. First, the flavor profile of the distillate will change significantly. The rich flavors present during the hearts will start to fade, as will the sweetness. The smell of the tails is difficult to describe, but it almost smells like a wet dog. Also, you'll begin to see an oily film on top of the product, which can be viewed at an angle in the right light just as gasoline can be seen floating on top of water. The distillate will also be slightly slippery to the touch when rubbed, when rubbed together between a finger and a thumb. Experienced distillers generally run their stills until the alcohol from the wash has reduced to somewhere around 10 to 20 proof. It is not worth the time and energy to distill any further. You can actually set the tails aside and run them as their own wash in the future to pull out a bit more product. The tails that have been saved from a run and kept for future use are called faints. Sometimes distillers will add them to the wash of the next distillation run, or they'll collect enough to make an all faints run. Just a reminder, allow your still to cool before disassembling, cleaning, and storing it for your next run. So what is a thumper keg and how does it work? A thumper keg is a metal or wooden vessel which sits between the still pot and condenser. It is designed to help the distiller avoid the necessity of repeat distillations. At the start of the distillation, the thumper keg is filled with a small amount of spirit tails from a previous batch, or some wash from the current batch, or simply water. 
As the wash boils in the pot still, heated vapors are drawn into the thumper keg via a swan neck. This swan neck sends the heated vapors directly into the solution contained within the thumper keg. As the vapor bubbles up through the liquid in the thumper, it is cooled into liquid form, adding to the thumper keg's contents. A thumping sound is generated as the vapors exit the swan neck and condenses in the thumper keg. The heat of the released vapors causes the solution in the thumper to reach the boiling point of alcohol once more. This causes more alcohol vapors to be generated, which are captured by the condenser, distilling it a second time and creating a high-proof spirit. It is a very time and energy efficient way to double distill a spirit. How to infuse flavor with a thumper keg. Distillers usually add spirit tails or water to their thumper keg to cool the alcohol vapors coming from the pot still. However, you can include other fruits, herbs, or spices to add different flavor combinations to your spirits. Some options to experiment with include adding fruit infused spirits to the thumper keg. Place your chosen fruits, herbs, and spices into a large container of heads or tails spirits and let it set for a week or two. The flavor of your ingredients will gradually infuse the solution. Add this solution to the bottom of the thumper keg to impart the flavors it contains. Adding juice or oils directly to the thumper keg. Ingredients like apple juice, peach juice, blackberry juice, lemon juice, pineapple juice, orange juice, and coconut oil can be added directly to the thumper keg to impart flavor. Adding raw ingredients directly into the thumper keg. Some distillers will add fruit peel, herbs, spices, and mashed fruit directly to the thumper keg. Just be aware that mashed fruit will need to be added in large quantities and may be messy to clean up. If using this technique to add fruit, make sure your produce is very ripe. So how big should a thumper keg be? A thumper keg should be anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of the size of your main boiler. If you plan to prime your thumper keg with a sizable charge, use a thumper keg that is at least 50 percent the size of your main boiler. Will a thumper keg take longer? A thumper will take a while to come online, so your run will take longer, but it'll also boost the purity by 10 to 20 proof in your run. This brings us to another mistake. In my opinion, using the thumper keg was a really bad idea. It took so long for my alcohol to start producing that I was unsure of everything that I was doing. Not only that, but when I disassembled my still, my thumper keg was completely full with liquid, which makes me realize that my thumper was way, way too small. So in my mind, that was a huge mistake. Now let's talk about the cooling temperature for water running through your condenser. A lot of blogs online, people don't pay any attention to this, but in my experience, the colder the water was, the better. When I first started running my still, I just used a few ice cubes and the yield was not that great. The drips were extremely erratic. Then as I went on, I actually added a ton of ice. I filled up the whole bin with ice. And at that point, my still started to produce a more steady, consistent stream, which uh, everybody talks about the one to three drips per second. So if I could recommend anything, I would add a ton of ice to the water running through your condenser. Uh, definitely can't hurt anything. Now, let's talk about my disappointing yet almost hilarious results. I ended up with nine jars of distillate, so I thought. My thinking was that uh, jars one, two, and three would be my heads, four, five, and six would be my hearts, and seven, eight, and nine would be my tails. So this is where one more mistake comes into play. I did not have a 250 milliliter test jar for my hydrometer. The only container that I had uh, needed at least 24 ounces of liquid for my hydrometer to be able to drop down into it. So I had to do two jars at a time. So I took jars eight and nine and proofed it. 
and it ended up being zero proof, basically just water. So then I realized that I didn't have as much distillate as I thought. So then I tested jars one and two, and that tested out to be 120 proof. Then I tested jars six and seven, that ended up being zero proof. So then I was thinking, well, I'm just gonna dump jar number five, because as you can see, my candy cane flavor didn't pick up until jar three. So I was kind of hoping that jars three and four would be my hearts. Well, I proofed it and it ended up being only 40 proof. So this is my hypothesis. Uh, when I did the, the distillate calculator, um, after the fact, I realized that I should have ended up with about 37 ounces of alcohol which means that probably jars one, two, and three was my distillate. Everything else was more or less water. So jar one would be my heads, jar two would be my hearts, and jar three would be my tails. Four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine was probably just water. Unfortunately, I had already combined jars one and two and actually dumped it out. So jar two was prob probably my hearts, and it was now down the drain. So after all this work, all this time, all this research, I have ended up with exactly zero product. But it's all right. Um, I did wanna mention one more mistake that I made, and that was the fact that I didn't, um, my, the, the wash of my ABV was too low, therefore my yield was too small. So the ABV of my wash, uh, the potential ABV, was right around 6.5%. I would have liked to see that closer to 10 or 11%. I would have yielded twice as much alcohol, and I would have had more volume to play with as far as finding where exactly where the hearts began and where the hearts ended. So my results are comical, but I did enjoy the journey. Now let's talk about some of the benefits of vodka. I was recently diagnosed with a sensitivity to yeast. And so obviously beer contains yeast, wine contains yeast, but I was curious as to whether or not distilled spirits contain yeast. I found some information that you're gonna find very interesting. Because distilling a drink usually removes most yeast byproducts from the liquid, the vast majority of them are considered yeast-free. The consensus is that the distillation process removes all but the most minute traces of yeast from these drinks. So, clear liquors such as vodka and gin are common choices for those on a yeast-free diet. They're also considered the best options for avoiding a hangover because they've been refined. The refining often removes undesirable congeners which are also believed to contribute to hangovers. So, opting for a clear spirit could be a doubly wise choice for the yeast intolerant drinker. Not only that, but pure alcohol products like rum, vodka, gin, tequila, and whiskey all contain zero carbs, which is perfect for the ketogenic or low carb diet. All right, in conclusion, I just wanted to touch on a few things. One topic I never talked about was the blending of the alcohols. You can actually blend them for taste, blend them to get a specific alcohol percentage, and that's one thing that I'm not familiar with, but you will want to do some research on if this is a hobby that you want to take up. I wanted to go over my mistakes really quickly because these are seven mistakes that prevented me from um, ending up with any product whatsoever, which is pretty funny, but... Um, Mistake number one is that I didn't cut the potatoes into small enough pieces. Mistake number two, my potato masher wasn't long enough, so I actually wasn't able to mash my potatoes. Mistake number three, I didn't have a second bucket, so I couldn't properly aerate my wash. Number four, I didn't clean my still good enough, so I actually got both oil residue and black flakes in my distillate. Number five, I thought that using the thumper was a really bad idea. Um, if I were to do it again, I would either use a really big thumper or just not use it at all. Mistake number six is that I didn't have a test jar for my hydrometer. Going forward, I plan to measure the alcohol content as I'm distilling so I can know exactly where I'm at in the process. 
whether I'm dealing with the heads or the hearts or the tails. And then my final mistake was that uh, the starting ABV of my wash was too low, so my yield was way too small. Instead of producing seven or eight jars, I only produced three jars of distillate. And as you saw, that ended up being a disaster. So I wanted to close on this. I actually went for a walk the other night and I began to think about all the planning and research and money that went into this project only to end up with nothing to show for it. And I couldn't help but to think about the irony because what is it that everybody says about life is uh, enjoy the journey. Sometimes we become so focused on the finish line that we fail to find joy in the journey. And I gotta tell you, this is such a cool hobby. I can't wait to try another batch um, without the thumper and uh, with a higher ABV and with all the proper tools. And it's just gonna be amazing. Um, now that I've actually cleaned out my still with a sacrificial, we'll call this my sacrificial run. <laughs> anyway, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching the Nash Potatoes Outdoor Show. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. We will see you next time.